Good afternoon, and welcome to the City Club of Cleveland. My name is Bob Papinetti, Executive Director of the Literacy Cooperative. Today we celebrate International Literacy Day, and I am pleased to introduce our speaker, Ralph R. Smith, Senior Vice President at the Annie E. Casey Foundation and Managing Director of the Campaign for Grade Level Reading. International Literacy Day was created by UNESCO, the United Nations Educational Scientific Cultural Organization, and is celebrated annually on September 8th. It was first celebrated in 1967, and its purpose is to focus public opinion and attention on the importance of literacy. UNESCO's website states that literacy is a fundamental human right and the foundation for lifelong learning. It is fully essential to social and human development and its ability to transform lives. For individuals, families, and societies alike, it is an instrument of empowerment to improve one's health, one's income, and one's relationship with the world. According to UNESCO, there are 775 million adults who have minimum literacy skills. And low literacy is not just a concern in other countries. According to a report issued last fall, we have 36 million adults, 36 million adults in the United States who are below basic literacy skills. By some measures, they are reading no better than the average third grader. This has significant and long-term consequences for our communities and our nation as a whole. We know that parents who are poor readers often don't read to their children, and those children are often unprepared to enter kindergarten. I first heard Ralph Smith speak at a literacy conference in Houston in 2011, and he shared some research and data that he had done concerning the importance of third grade reading and the need to connect parents with their children's education. As managing director of the Campaign for Grade Level Reading, Ralph Smith has been forging consensus around ensuring that children reach the critical milestone of grade level reading by the end of third grade and helping parents become their children's first teacher and best advocate. Ralph Smith has served since 1994 on the senior leadership team of the Annie E. Casey Foundation, a private philanthropy established by Jim Casey, founder of United Parcel Services, dedicated to helping build better futures for disadvantaged children in the United States. A nationally recognized legal scholar, Mr. Smith previously served for two decades as a law faculty of the University of Pennsylvania. As Chief of Staff and Chief Operating Officer for the Philadelphia School District, Mr. Smith led the effort to develop and implement the district's voluntary desegregation plan. He also headed the school district's negotiation team that led to some of the nation's first education reform-driven teacher contracts. Mr. Smith is a founding director of both the National Center on Fathers and Families and the Philadelphia Children's Network. In 2010, Mr. Smith received the Jane Addams Distinguished Leadership Award from the United Neighborhood Centers of America for his lifelong work to improve quality of life for low-income individuals and families through more effective social policy and practice. He is the 2011 recipient of the Fred Rogers Leadership and Philanthropy Award from Grantmakers for Children, Youth, and Families and he is the 2014 International Literacy Day keynote speaker at the City Club of Cleveland. I am very privileged and honored to present Ralph R. Smith. Good afternoon. When I heard Bob earlier today, I said I would take him on the road with me to talk about the campaign for grade level reading. You know, I'm going to take him on the road with me just to introduce me. <laughs> Thank you. That was a gracious and generous introduction. And uh, I will begin by telling you that I am not 100 years old. I'm West Indian. And those of you who know anything about West Indians know we, we all do three jobs at the same time. And that accounts for that, uh, for that resume. I, I'm de delighted to be in Cleveland. And I just saw my longtime friend, LaJean Ray, back there, and uh, Pat Rideout. And I remember driving to Cleveland a decade ago to applaud the amazing work that they were doing then and uh, still doing now. And it's great to see them here. And when you think about Cleveland, especially in the business 
that I am in these days, and that's the business of philanthropy. You realize you're coming home in a way. This is, this is where much of it started. And I, had, I plan to be here uh, in six weeks when philanthropy from around the country and really the world will come here to Cleveland uh, to celebrate the centennial anniversary of the Community Foundation movement in the United States, a movement that has stretched uh, around the world. And in coming to Cleveland, you cannot help but be reminded that you're coming to the place where Steve Minter made such an incredible contribution, and that was the platform for his influence on philanthropy around the country. And today, you come to the place where Ron Richard leads the Cleveland Foundation in a manner that inspires all of us around the country to dare to be and dare to do more. So when I come to Cleveland, I come with enormous uh, burden of respect and trepidation for friends. Mr. Mayor, this is a great city, and I am glad that it's provided me an opportunity to say yes to the persistent Bob Papanetti, <laughs> because he is relentless, <laughs> absolutely relentless, and I appreciate that. And to give me a chance to get to meet Joyce Daniels and to reconnect with Sharon Sobel Jordan. This is a city where much is happening and there is much of which to be proud. This is a city that called Mario Marina home. Uh, Mario M Marina is a friend and I claim him as a mentor. And there was a point when Mario says, said to us all, I'm going home. And by home, he didn't mean he was leaving the meeting and going to Northern Virginia. <laughs> by home, it meant he was getting on a plane and moving his entire family back to Cleveland. And that says very much about the pull, the magnetism, and it uh, speaks to the future of the city. You know, being here on International Literacy Day is really special to me for a number of re reasons. I was one of those young readers. I can't remember a time when I wasn't reading. And reading essentially gave me many insights, the first of which was that nap time in kindergarten is really for the teacher. <laughs> This is, this, is, this is really like the mental health break. <laughs> and those of us who didn't nap during the day were a source of considerable frustration and annoyance to our kindergarten teacher. And then she solved the problem. She would sit me on a pillow, she would put stacks of books all around me, and she'd say, oh, Ralph, will you just read? And, you know, I was delighted. And so she'd put the three or four other miscreants who refused to take naps around me. And I would read. And that was such a wonderful thing to read and have an audience. You know, it's probably the reason why I became a law professor. You know, it was, it was that. So I, I recall the earliest memories I have involve reading. And I know that I have become the favorite nephew of my favorite aunt because she was a librarian and I love libraries. And it was in the library that Judy Bolton student nurse and Nancy Drew and the Hardy Boys and Tom Swift, it was in the library that this gang came together and took me on journeys around the world and across the universe. 
and I learned to dream of things I never could. This kid from the Virgin Islands knew about autumn and knew about summer and knew about what goes on in New England towns and what happens when the spaceship gets marooned someplace. So I come, now let me tell you as a early reader, uh, I have good news and bad news. The good news is that as a third grader, I think I turned eight, had a birthday. One of my aunts, it probably was the same aunt, knew exactly what to get me. And she got me the unabridged version of you know, the Charles Dickinson, you know. And I could hardly wait to read it. In fact, I thought the party went on uh, too, 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 too long, much too long. I wanted to get to the book. Now, it's, it's, I had the same reaction and response to reading uh, Dickens as kids today had a few years ago reading Harry Potter. Remember the kids would stand in line, get, you know, we all say the kids don't want to read. Uh, and they would get books that were several hundred pages and be like, well, I, I was uh, one of those kids. So, you know, being able to uh, celebrate International Literacy Day is really important to me. I was also a kid who, because my reading wasn't mediated often by adults, uh, came to some clear conclusions. Uh, one, if you uh, if you try to feed me a mushroom for about 20 years, I was in law school and probably out on a date before I would venture to eat a mushroom. Because I read that it was difficult to tell the difference between a mushroom and a toadstool. And having no adult around to tell me otherwise, I decided, well, there's a way to deal with that problem. Don't eat either one. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, every now and then, those of us who are early readers find that some of our tics are perfectly explain explainable if we recall what we were reading and, and when. But, you know, I think that because I'm an early reader, I, I feel particularly pained when I hear the statistics about adults who can't read, you know, and I, I, I find that to be almost claustrophobic, you know, it is hard to figure out how you negotiate the world. And in fact, there's a way in which you have to develop enormous respect uh, for those adults who do. And empathy for those who live their lives closeted in illiteracy and hiding it from the world and from their children. There's something especially painful about that. And yet, across this country, in this state and in this city, there are adults who live that life and because they live that life, they increase the likelihood that their children could as well. You know, I think I, I was invited here not because of most of the resume, and certainly I don't think you have a shortage of uh, recovering law teachers uh, from, from which you could hear. I think it was because Four years ago, at the Annie E. Casey Foundation, we published a report, a report that as many as 80% of low-income children were failing to attain the critical milestone of grade level reading uh, by the end of third grade. And we noted that that was a powerful warning about what would happen in terms of their educational experience, their likelihood of graduation, and their prospects for escaping into generational poverty. 
and we say this is a catastrophe in the making and we issued a call to action and we thought that we should be among the first to answer that call and so we started the campaign for grade level reading and ask corporations and foundations around the country to join in this collaborative effort. And we called it a campaign because we didn't think this was an initiative where we needed to develop new knowledge. This was an occasion to close the gap between what we know and what we do. That's why we needed a campaign. And as we thought about it, we knew that there was no magic formula, no secret potion, no silver bullet. We think that to stand a chance of moving the needle on grade level reading, three things must co-occur. One, we have to assure every child, every child, quality teaching in every setting, every day. Notice I said every setting, not just every classroom, in every setting. And that's at home, in the childcare program, in church, in the after school program, and in school every child in every setting, every day. Adults must be prepared and willing to provide quality teaching. Two, we should acknowledge that especially for low-income kids, we have got to do a substantially better job of ensuring continuity of care, services, and family supports. We have got to resolve that we're going to fix the gaps and the cracks and the chasms through which so many children and families fall. It is a wonder that any of them get the services they need when they need it. And it is a fact that too few get what they need in the sequence needed. And the third thing we've got to do is to mobilize communities to solve this problem and to take on the most vulnerable <coughs> children. And let me say when I say mobilize communities, I believe that we've got to hold present two propositions. Proposition number one is that schools, ha we have to be persistent, insistent, consistent to the point of truculence, that schools must be accountable to do better with the children that they have and not the children they'd prefer to have. We have got to say, <laughs> thank you. We have got to remind educators that parents aren't keeping their good kids at home and sending the others to school. <laughs> They're sending to schools the best kids they have and the only kids they have. So we're not, there's no need to wait for the better kids to show up. They're not coming. They're already here. But as you say that, and you know, usually half the room applauds at that because the other half of the educators who are now tr tr trying to decide whether it's the kung fu stance or the fetal position because they think they know what's coming next. You don't. I think we've got to stop beating up on schools, on teachers, and educators. We need a generation of folks who are stronger and better than we are, and we're not going to get that if we keep blaming schools and educators and pointing fingers and blaming them for problems that are not first of their making. That is important to say. The rest of us, and I said this earlier today, the rest of us have to stop deciding whether we want to sit in the boxes or the bleachers. We've got to get out of the stands, get on the field, get off the sidelines on the field and get in the game. And what that means is to understand that there are kids who are going to be failed even by good schools with high quality teaching. 
And that's an assertion that's really troubling, given the fact how much we believe that we ought to work for good schools with high quality teaching. There are three kids, three sets of kids who are going to be failing. One, those kids who start off so far behind that they can't catch up. They just cannot catch up in three years. And it is not because of the kids. It's because, one, they're so far behind that to get them to catch up, we have to invest significantly more resources than we're willing to. And that's why this campaign here in Cleveland, the first 2,000 days, is so important. We have got to make sure those kids aren't so far behind when they get to school. Second, those kids who are falling farther behind during the school year because they're missing too many days of school. Chronic absence is an epidemic, an epidemic all across the city. It is a, all across this country. It is, it is an epidemic that is hidden in plain view because we are so conditioned to look for unexcused absences that we ignore the excused absences. And if a kid is absent for any reason, excused or unexcused, it will not matter whether you have a great teacher with a great lesson plan in that classroom. The kid is not there to benefit from it. So that kid who is missing because of asthma, because of uh, oral health care, because of the slew of health problems that affect and afflict kids from low-income families, we need to help parents figure out how to solve those problems to get their kids to school. And thirdly, thirdly, we've known for a century, it is undisputed that children lose ground over the summer and that low-income kids lose more ground. Nobody contests that. And yet, no city, no city in this, in this country has organized itself to provide what is being called the community wraparound to take care of kids during the summer. So summer after summer after summer, we know that kids will lose, will, will lose ground. And yet we depend on the goodwill of strangers and a patchwork of programs that somehow magic will happen. And when magic doesn't, those kids go back to school in September, farther behind than when they left in June. I took on this work because, as my checkered resume suggests, I come to this as a second career. And the question I had to ask myself was this. How is it that we could know as much as we do, spend as much as we do, care as much as we say we do, and accomplish so little for so many kids over so long a period of time as to compromise permanently their capacity to grow up, to be responsible citizens and effective parents. And the answer I derived was that we don't know as much as we think we do, and we often lack the personal courage and political will to act on what we do know. We don't spend as much as we may need to, but it's until we do better with what we have, it's going to be extraordinarily difficult to make the case for what we need. And we don't care as much as we say we do, because some kids matter more than others, and some kids matter not at all. That is the challenge we are taking up. And that is a challenge that we are delighted. There are 152 communities around the country who think that it's long past time to put a stake in the ground and say, we care about third grade reading and have joined uh, the campaign 
under their own names, consistent with their own priorities. Uh, I, I love Arizona Reads. I love Let's Get Reading Georgia. These, these communities and states have come to the conclusion that, in fact, there is something about reading to which we ought to pay attention. If there is such a thing as an intergenerational compact, it ought to include that children, that we will ensure that children will be born healthy, that they will be thriving at three, that they will be ready at five, and they will be reading by third. If there's such a thing as an intergenerational compact, this ought to be our end of it. However, while kids may not know, and certainly won't recall whether they were born healthy, and they may not understand what thriving at three means, and they may not be fully sure about ready for school. But what kids know is whether we taught them to read. And that fourth grader who is sitting there unable to read, to learn, what they know is our generation has failed them. What they know is that we have left them with a compromised future. And if now we say, we say these kids may not read proficiently, we didn't say they weren't smart. They can figure out that they have been victimized and abandoned by us. So let me ask you, if you were the fourth grader, how much confidence would you have in us? How much should you pay attention to our social norms? How much should you try to behave so that other kids could learn? Is it not possible that by the time you're in fourth grade and you realize your future is permanently compromised, that you might decide that you ought not to care about a society that obviously doesn't care about you? And could that possibly explain the complexion of our juvenile justice system? Could it not explain the costs that we pay in so many ways for folks who we are willing to call antisocial? You know, in many respects, teaching a kid to read is a down payment on the intergenerational compact. It is a statement of our commitment to the future, a loud and profound statement which is fully understood by all, especially the young. And you know, if we can figure out how to teach kids to read, maybe they will have confidence enough confidence in us that they will invest in their future. Because in many respects, when we teach a kid to read, we unleash, we unleash the most powerful ally we have. And you know the most powerful ally we have in helping kids? The kids themselves. The kids themselves. They become enable, they become an agent of their own success. They become partners in the enterprise on which we have embarked. When we teach a kid to read and we inspire confidence, maybe they can believe that despite the rhetoric, that we care more about a bequest to our children of smaller debt and a balanced budget. They may come to believe that we understand that the intergenerational compact calls for a bequest to leave our kids a nation that is safe and strong, secure, respected, and at peace with the world, that we have clean air to breathe, 
water to drink, arable soil. Uh, they may absolutely believe that we have a nation that is willing to invest in its, its infrastructure so its bridges aren't collapsing, its tunnels imploding, water mains exploding. They may begin to believe that we have a nation that is prepared to ensure them what should be their birthright, and that is the opportunity to develop their full potential, an opportunity not to be burdened either by poverty itself or the costs and consequences of allevi alleviating it and solving the problems we leave behind. I believe that teaching kids to read is a powerful statement and perhaps the most important statement any community can, meet, can make. Now, lots of communities have signed on, put a stake in the ground. Nobody has solved the problem. No one has figured it out. There is no place that can claim victory. So here, in the city of Frederick Goff and Steve Minta and Ron Richard and Sharon Sobel of Legene, Legene Ray. Mayor, why not Cleveland? Thank you. Today at the City Club of Cleveland, we're enjoying a special program featuring Ralph Smith, Senior Vice President and Managing Director of the Campaign for Grade Level Reading at the NE Casey Foundation. I'm Dan Malthrop, Chief Executive of the City Club of Cleveland, and we will return to our speaker momentarily for the traditional City Club question and answer period. We encourage you to formulate your questions now and remind you that your questions should be brief and to the point. We welcome all of you here and those joining us via our live webcast, which is sponsored by the University of Akron. Our primary media partner, is 90.3 WCPN, WVIZ PBS, 104.9 WCLV Idea Stream, and they carry our Friday forums, and as do many other radio stations across the region and country. Television broadcasts of the City Club are made possible by Cleveland State University and PNC. This Friday, September 12th, the City Club is pleased to welcome author Ari Shavit. He's the winner of one of the Annisfield Wolf Book Awards. For more information about our upcoming and any of our past forums, you are invited to visit us online at cityclub.org. Today's program is part of the Education Innovation Series, funded by a generous grant from the Nordson Corporation. We thank you for your support. Today we welcome guests at tables hosted by many, many corporate partners and community organizations, all of which are listed in your program. I'd like to specifically recognize Horizon Science Academy and Shaw High School. I wonder if the students could stand to be recognized. Thank you students for your hard work. Thank you teachers for your hard work as well. Now it's time for the traditional City Club question and answer period. We welcome questions from everyone, including guests of the City Club. Holding our microphones today are content associate Teddy Eisenberg and marketing and outreach specialist Kirsten Pianca. Our first question. Teddy, we've got one right over there. Um, my name is Ali Mohammed, and I'm from Horizon Science Academy. Um, in my experience as a student, many other students don't really have an interest in reading and don't like to read. So how could we get students to actually enjoy reading? Um, you, know, you know, I'm going to invite Bob to <laughs> weigh in on that. But let, let me tell you that how many people remember Classics Illustrated? You know, a lot of the students who say they don't like to read, right, ask if they read comic books. And what we find is a lot of kids read comic books and don't see it as reading. For me, Classics Illustrated really was this incredible gateway. It gave me just enough to be really, really interested in what the real books had to say. And so by the time I got to where I was being assigned those books, I was ready and anxious and waiting. 
part of what I th the challenge is, uh, and we find it with, with our own kids and those of us who are lifelong readers, I tell you, is not genetically uh, passed on. Uh, this, is, this, this has to be essentially curated in each generation. And we've got to find a way to pique the curiosity of, 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 of young people. We've, that starts f with the very conversation with parents. It, call, it starts with having the kids surrounded uh, by books. And let me say, I'm, I'm so old fashioned. I still love books, you know. I, my son comes by and he says, he points to me and he, and, and he says, my dad prints stuff so he can read it, you know? <laughs> And the kids laugh because they have found the dinosaur. Uh, you know, but I still love books, and I still believe that surrounding kids with books and being able to point to the pictures and engage them in conversation develops a curiosity, develops the enthusiasm, and develops the love of reading. I, I still absolutely believe in that. And then use the comic books. Bob, what is your, what is your answer to that question? Find something that they like, that they can find relevant, that uh, interests them. See, he says it in nine words. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I'm a grandfather. And because I'm concerned with the education and the literacy education of my grandkids, and being a geek, so I, just, so I just decided to start a company and develop mobile applications and literacy games for my grandkids, but not just for my grandkids, but for all kids. And what I found that as an entrepreneur is that there's a great opportunity, and maybe you can uh, t speak to this, is that private industry can be a part of the educational ecosystem to partner with uh, communities and educational facilities to be a partner in developing programs and applications that can help deliver uh, the, this 21st century education to kids that might not have access to this type of thing. And we've been finding great success even in uh, countries like Africa, uh, Cambodia and Brazil where these games that have been started to develop we're developing pilot programs and we're looking forward to bringing those back here to the states and connecting the dots collaboratively we can work together but what do you think about private industries a role in, a, in a helping to be a, have, be a solution in this, to this problem of the liter literacy now, now if we if we knew each other before we have to we have to confess that we don't uh, this would be a softball question I, I served on the board of leapfrog uh, for several years. So I obviously believe uh, that the private sector has a great uh, opportunity here. Let me back up and say that technology can help immensely. It, technology can reach the hard to reach parents. It can provide uh, very powerful lessons and examples and what to do. So we need to, to not abandon high touch, but to figure out how we find a mix of high touch and high tech. The private sector has a really important role. The challenge of the private sector, and it's an important challenge, is how to make the best products available to the folks who could least afford it. One of the challenges I found serving on LeapFrog is we had an enormous uh, body of research saying that our products worked, but we also had substantial evidence that the price point was too high for the parents who needed it most. That is a problem that has n that's yet to be solved. And I think that as the industry, the entire tech industry, uh, changes in composition and in outlook, we're going to have more people committing to, sol to solving that problem. We have got to get the best products in the hands of the, ch of the, of the families who need them most. And right now, that's not happening because the, pri the price point is much, is much too high. But you know, more power to you because that is the right question. If we don't get the private sector on board, it's unlikely that we're going to make as much progress as we need to. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, there's a national movement on to privatize public education, being led by the American Ex uh, Legislative Exchange Council, who in turn has sent legislation to the states called the Third Grade Reading Guarantee. And in talking to my third grade teachers, colleagues of mine, 
Uh, they talk about third graders becoming physically ill, urinating, vomiting, because of the, the tests that they are being made to take and being retained in third grade, even though their teachers say they can read, but they can't pass the tests. So my question to you is, when you listed that, gave that wonderful list of three things that need to be done, more testing was not one of them. And so how do you respond to what's happening and these third graders are ending up hating school and being turned off to reading because they're made to feel that they can't read because of these tests? You know, that's, that's the question I, I, you know, you hope you get right at the very end and somebody <laughs> says, somebody says, well, you don't have it. <laughs> Let me, let me see if I could parse the question. Uh, I think there are issues uh, with what f some folks would call the privatization of education. And that's a whole different set of issues. And I will admit to being an agnostic on the governance model. I think we need to try everything that works. And not everything will work every place. So I'm, I'm an agnostic on that. I think there's an issue about high stakes testing. I don't know, you know, there's some things that we know a lot about, and there are some things we know a little about, and there's some things we don't know too much. I think the jury is out on the value uh, and reliability of high stakes testing as it applies to children generally. You know, you aim at the average and you get the average, the problem is there's nobody there. You know, uh, that's why it's the average, because it's a, it's a sort of a funny little thing. It's a mathematical calculation that doesn't, uh, doesn't really get to anybody. So I am not, I am not agnostic on high stakes. I don't think we know enough to, and especially if it's high stakes testing, you know, how do you do on any one day? You know, and, and I say that as a really good test taker. You know, I, I mean, for personally, I just give me the test, you know, go away, let me spend the three hours and we'll be fine. But I am absolutely not sure that that uh, makes a lot of sense for a whole lot of people, uh, for a whole lot of people. The, the issue of the third grade guarantee sometimes forces us to choose between two, and I say equally bad options. You know, as much as it pains some of my friends, social promotion is a bad option. And retention in and of itself is another bad option. And what we should essentially say is we shouldn't be forced to choose between two bad options. Now, what's in the middle? Some kids need better teaching. Some kids need more time. Some kids need more individualized instruction. Some of the problems are too long standard to deal with in just one year. We need to sort of lower the volume and the heat of the debate and figure out how to make things work. That response pleases nobody on either side of the debate, but I think it is, I think it is, is, is what we need to do. I don't believe that, a, that we can defend um, things that feel onerous to kids and th things that look punitive to kids on the basis that it's going to make the adults behave or the adults do better. Now, the problem is there's some evidence that it does, but it's a bad reason to, to, for, 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 what, for what we do. What we've got to decide, what we've got to decide is it matters that kids read well when they go into fourth grade. Now, what are we going to do? And here in Cleveland, I think you've got 326 kids who are retained. What are we going to do for those 326 kids? And assume that there are another 326 on the other side of that line who got through for a number of reasons who still can't read. What are we going to do? And by using a single test or a single strategy or a single thing, what we do is we end up with a whole lot of kids on the wrong side of the line, no matter where we draw it. And it feels as if we need a, 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 a better conversation, a wider range of options, 
and really an opportunity to figure out together. We work pretty closely with the Foundation for Excellence in, ed in Education. They are strongly associated with retention statutes. Why do we work with them? Because they now put as much emphasis on early intervention and support as they do on retention. Uh, what we are, and they now understand that the rapid implementation, the too rapid implementation of a, of a retention policy is not good for kids, it's not good for educators, it's not good for anybody. So what we're seeing across the country is uh, the evolution of more thoughtful policy and more thoughtful implementation, and we think it's heading in the right direction. And here in Ohio, you have an opportunity to show the rest of us how to do it. And I'm hoping that uh, there are enough people on both sides of that debate who are willing now with uh, a little bit of experience under your belts with, uh, to say, okay, let's figure it out uh, and let's figure out how we can improve this. This is a great opportunity uh, here in Ohio and I hope you take advantage of it. Yes, thank you. I've been uh, doing university teaching for many years in West Africa, but every now and then I would come home for a vacation, and it seems to me about 15 years ago, um, I was so disappointed to learn that many of the school systems had stopped teaching phonics. And in my opinion, phonics is a key component to reading. It also occurred to me, and I haven't done any research, and I haven't looked at the statistics either, but it seems to me by casual observation that when we stop teaching phonics, the ability of our students to read began to decline, and that was around when we started graduating people who were functionally illiterate, which means they have a bank of memorized words. But since they hadn't properly been taught phonics, they don't know how to sound out the word blendings, and they can't figure it out. I would like to know who made this policy decision. Where, where did that start? And Really, when did it start, and when will we get it back? I, I, I looked. <laughs> I looked around. I looked around, Bob. Um, you know, uh, the, the question uh, and the, what you said before the question uh, meant that you had the good fortune to miss the reading wars, uh, and the reading wars are not unlike the current retention or promotion wars. People who should be on the same side because they want to get to the same result decide that there's only one way to get there and that's theirs. And some of us remember, and since this is not my area, I can speak with absolute expertise. Uh, so <laughs> some, of, some of us recall listening to the proponents of whole language and listening to the proponents of phonics and thinking, you know, you two should really go have a beer, you know. <laughs> Sit down and work this out, but the sides were so entrenched that we ended up, and it wasn't clear who won, uh, and we ended up spending a decade uh, essentially at war with ourselves and at war with uh, folks who basically agreed with us on where we want to go. And I, I think that history is proving that it's neither just phonics nor whole language, that the issues of comprehension, vocabulary, phonemic awareness, all, vocabulary and phonics, all are important if we're going to deal uh, with helping children to learn to read and to learn to, to, to read well. So that was a decade of, uh, you know, wasted energy, and I say that with due respect to the people in the room who were involved in that war and have the scars to prove it. Uh, I think we need, we need not to repeat that again, and that's why I implore the people of Ohio uh, to figure out how to take the third 
grade reading guarantee and really <laughs> make it work rather than spending another decade fighting about it and then we'll come back and say, you no, know, we should have stopped the fight a decade ago and really figured out how to work together. Uh, yes, sir. Appreciate your comments today. The one that resonates the most is what we know and what we do. And with regard to that, outside of policy and uh, directions given by uh, school boards and leadership and legal ramifications, what are some other compelling factors that can lead to success in reading? Because reading is a discipline. And, you know, you yourself as a young person talked about how you love to read. And unfortunately, a lot of young people you know, first of all, they don't develop that love, let alone develop that discipline to be successful in the process. So what might you suggest could be other compelling factors to help young people be successful in reading? You know, uh, you know Bob is being so disciplined uh, that I, I'm, 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 I'm embarrassed that he's being so disciplined, but I, I'm grateful. Let me uh, respond to the question. This is not a, a full response, but just based on the campaign. We think that there are two factors that, to which we have to pay attention. And one, factor number one, you've already heard, parents. We have got to get to parents early, especially parents who can't read. You know, when I was at the school district in Philadelphia, you'd go to a school meeting and people say, well, you know, the parents here can't read. And so we generally don't talk about reading because we don't want to embarrass them. So I said, okay. So, you know, you develop, so I would put, you know, $20 on the table. I said, I bet that be, within the next 15 minutes, I could get every person in this room to figure out how they're going to help their kid to become a reader. And you know, people say, well, you, you're, you're out 20 bucks, you know? I say, oh, and then you say, oh, by the way, you got to split it. This is all you get, right? But they begin to listen. And you say, you, you, then we go with books and we have some big, big pictures. And we say, get a book with big pictures and then make up a story. Because you can make up a better story that's in the book anyway. So make up a story. And then you tell them, now the thing about make up a story is you've got to remember the story. Because the kid will remember. We've all been there, right? You try to, you try to change it, you try to skip a page. The kid's not going to do that. So you've got to make up a story and you've got to use the pictures to make up your story. And you've got to tell the same story every time on the same page. And you know, parents are saying, what's so hard about that? I could do that. And you say, okay, now it comes to the, the, the tricks you ought to know to get your kid to read. And they're looking, well, what's the trick? And you could just see, I can't read. Say first, since we're not in Japan, we've got to read from front to back. And you've got to turn the page slowly so your kid gets accustomed to reading from front to back. Parents are like, I could do that. And you say, the really important thing now is to train your kid's eyes. And when you say train your kid's eyes, this sounds like really important work. So the parents are now leaning forward. I, you're going to teach me how to train my kid's eyes? Then you, there's some, always somebody with a baby in the audience that say, yes, the most important thing is to get your baby to learn to read from left to right. And you move your fingers across the line. And what does the baby do? The baby follows your finger. I mean, this is, this is, nobody's surprised by this. But the parents, and you could tell the parents who didn't read to their kids, because they were amazed. This was like magic, that the baby is actually following your finger. So they're following the finger from left to right, from left to right. And then you say, and it's part of training the eyes. You have to get them to go from top to bottom and you move your finger across the page, and the baby, baby is so compliant, you know, the babies look at your finger, and by the time you get to the bottom, at practically every meeting, you see parents grabbing that book and rushing out of the meeting. Nobody ever stopped to, to, to get their share of the $20, because the parents who themselves can't read are the most anxious to be helped. But if we're whispering, and we're afraid to talk about it. And we're not giving them any clues, any hints, any help. No wonder the kids can't read. That's on us. 
we have got to find ways to acknowledge what the data tell us and then find ways to help parents who are not literate themselves get their kids, get their kids reading. And it can be done if we care enough to do it. I, this happened time after time after time. These parents desperately want their kids to read. They know what their life has been like. They don't want that for their kids. So we have a powerful, powerful incentive uh, opportunity. And then, number two, we got to help kids get glasses. Vision to Learn, a program in Los Angeles, and really in California. They have screened about 100,000 kids. I'm not sure about the numbers, but 20% of the kids they screen need the glasses. 20% of the kids are good. We have kids in first, second, and third grade who can't see the board. Those kids are not learning to read. And those kids are not learning. So we've got to pay attention to the health issues all along. And we've got to acknowledge that just because a parent isn't themselves literate doesn't mean they can't be a powerful ally in getting their own kids to read. And that I would invest. I would bet the house on parents and get the kid glasses. Today at the City Club, we have been enjoying a special program featuring Ralph R. Smith, Senior Vice President at the Annie E. Casey Foundation and Managing Director of the Campaign for Grade Level Reading. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This forum is now closed. Thank <laughs> you.